My name is Brian Girard, and I serve on staff at First Christian Church of Louisville, Kentucky. As we gather for worship, we do so in the wake of the grand jury decision in the Breonna Taylor case. Brianna's death is a tragedy, and her name is another in a growing list of names that should not exist. A list that leaves families and communities grieving, afraid, and longing for a more just and equitable world. We can and we must do better than this. In response to the grand jury's decision, there have been ongoing pro protests throughout Louisville. While most of them have been peaceful, there have been some instances where things have gone too far. Property has been damaged, violence has broken out, and last Wednesday night, two police officers were shot. That is not acceptable. Thankfully, those officers are recovering and the person responsible has been arrested. In fact, I read an article on Saturday morning that it was a protester who led the police to the suspect. When interviewed, he said, we are here to seek justice for Brianna, not to hurt police officers. This is an unsettling, uncertain, and scary moment for our city. We grieve and are angered by the tragedy of Brianna's death, and we gr are grieved and angered by those who move beyond peaceful protesting into a place of violence and destruction. Bottom line, we are grieving. We are afraid and we are crying out, how long, O oh Lord? While there is much work for us to do, one of the most important things that we can do is offer ourselves, our worries, and our hopes to God. We pray. We worship. We seek comfort in Scripture. We gather around the table of grace. And then we take steps. We get involved. We do something toward helping our community move forward together as a whole people. So as we pray this morning, I'm going to give you a moment of silence to offer your prayers, whatever they may be to God. If you can't find the words, feel free to take some time and just enjoy the scene behind me. This is the sanctuary of my backyard, and it is a place I often go when I need to seek God's comfort and wisdom. I'll move out of the way as we pray so that you can spend this time alone with God. Let us turn now to God in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with hearts that are filled with all kinds of thoughts and emotions. Please accept them as we offer ourselves to you in this time of prayer. O oh God, receive all the prayers that are written on our hearts as we offer to you the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your I'm Gary Fogel, and we see that the calendar has just turned to the fall of the year. That's exciting. We'll always like a new season. And one of the things the kids like about the fall of the year is they know Halloween's right around the corner. They get to go trick-or-treating, and they love the candy and the treats. And we as adults love handing it out. We love to see the smiling faces. But let us never forget, especially this time of the year as well, that uh, there are people in this world and people in our community who need more than just treats. They need the basics, so let's always remember them. Let's give, let's give with joy, and let's be excited for them and how we can help, not only this time of the year, but year-round. Thank you much. Today we're wrapping up a series that has explored how Scripture and how our faith can get us through those meantime moments of life. Those moments where we aren't where we were, we're not where we want to be. We're just kind of stuck somewhere in the middle. More specifically, this series has addressed the meantime moment that we've all faced as we've journeyed through this pandemic. Our lives are not what they were pre-COVID-19. They're certainly not what we, what we hope they will be post-COVID-19. We're just kind of stuck in the middle of the journey. And as if a pandemic wasn't enough, there, there continues to be uh, civil unrest, and we're in the middle of a presidential election that is demonstrating just how divided we are as a people, and we really aren't where we were and where we want to be. We are stuck in a place that many of us are finding uncomfortable. And we just can't wait to get to the other side, but we wonder how can we do it, and how can we have the strength and the comfort and the wisdom that we need from God to complete the journey? Well, our, our last lesson for this series is a scripture passage that I think has a key message to us, a secret, if you will, um, some wisdom and advice that if we will listen to it, will be a great help to us, and it will also help us get to where we need to be. It, uh, it comes from uh, the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, and it begins with these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. I, I love the way this passage describes God. God is the parent, the creator of compassion. Just as just, God creates compassion, God is the source of compassion. God is the God of all comfort. I just think that's such a beautiful description of God and one that gives me a lot of comfort. Paul continues, this, 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 God of this, this creator of compassion and the God of all comfort is one who comforts us in all our troubles. 
So God is a God who created compassion, created care, and comforts us, not just in some of our troubles, but in all of our troubles. Now, I want to focus on this word comfort here, because this word isn't just some mild word. It's, it's, a, it's a deep sense of comfort. It's, it's, it's comfort to the extreme. And, and in order to understand God's sense of this comfort, this sense of care that God has created, I, I want you to think about uh, times in your life when someone that you deeply love and care about is in trouble, for whatever reason. Um, something that's happened in their lives, um, a sickness, an injury, an illness, a decision that they made, uh, something that they, a decision that they didn't make, but something happens through no fault of their own, a time when someone you love deeply is in trouble, a child, a spouse, a partner, a best friend, a parent, a loved one. If you've been in those moments, you know the fear that comes in those moments, the worry that comes in those moments. It's, it's like your heart almost can't take it. It, it. it hurts so much, you want to change places with them. That's how God feels when we are in trouble. That's what this comfort word is getting at. It's the deepest sense of comfort. It's the kind of comfort we want to offer the people we love when they find themselves in trouble. When we are in trouble, when we are hurting, God feels about us the way we feel about the people on that list I mentioned just a moment ago. That's, that's how much God loves us. That's what this comfort and care is about. The passage continues now with, with two very important words. There's a, there's a reason that, that, that all of this is true. There's a reason that, this, that God created compassion and that God created comfort and that God comforts us in all of our troubles. There is a reason, and we know there's a reason because the next two words say, so that. All of this happens so that. Now, now when we read those two words, we might think that what's going to follow is that God has created comfort and compassion and that God comforts us in all of our troubles so that I will feel better in the midst of them so that God will care for me in the midst of them. And, and I do think to some degree that's true, but that's not where Paul is going with this. Instead, he writes that God does all of these things so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So God has created comfort God has given birth, given life to comfort so that God can care for us in all of our troubles, not just so that we will be comforted, but so that having been cared for and comforted by God, we will care for and comfort others. This is a continuation of the teaching in 1 John that we are called to love others because God first loved us us. This is a reminder that as many benefits as there are to Christian faith, as many things that as we, that as many of the things that we, as there are, while there are so many things that we receive as individual members of faith, benefits, grace, care, love, all those things that change our individual lives, when it comes to our faith, it isn't all about me. In fact, it's more about others. That, that's the heart of our faith. And so God doesn't just love us and care for us because it's all about me. God loves me and cares for me so that I will learn how to love and care for you. Every bit of grace, every bit of care, every bit of love that God gives me, God does so, not just for me, but for you. And every bit of care that God gives you, every bit of love, every bit of grace, every bit of compassion that God gives you, God doesn't just give that to you for your benefit. He gives that to you so that you can care for me and love me and other people in your life and in your world, those you know and even strangers, even your enemy, God says. See, this is a really, really powerful passage. God sees us in this meantime moment of trouble and God cares for us. But one of the, the, one of the biggest reasons God cares for us is so that we will care for others. And it's only through that care, it's only through that care, when we quit making it all about me and we begin to care for others, it's only through that care that we get to the other side of this. So let me give you a very specific 
example. And there's, there's plenty of examples that we could look at, but let's, let's talk about COVID-19 for just a second. So in about the last six months, there's been 200, 000, over 200,000 people who have died in our country, just, just our country. And, and that is a, a, just an astonishing and heartbreaking number. But it's not just a number. Every single one of those deaths, every single one of those people is, is a son or a daughter, a father or a mother, a grandparent, a niece, a nephew, an uncle, an aunt, a close friend, a spouse, a partner, every single one of those deaths, every single life lost has created a, a sea of grief. And as many people have died, many hundreds of thousands more people have had their lives torn apart because their loved one died far too early and far too quickly. Now, in response to this, I've heard some people say things about COVID-19, and they're offering it out of a sense of hope. And maybe you've heard this, and maybe you've said this, that, you know, most of the people who get critically ill or most of the people who have died, they've got underlying conditions, or they're really old, that COVID-19 really doesn't impact the healthy and the young and all those kinds of things. And You know, my wife was recently at an event and someone trying to offer this sense of hope, couching as such, said that 90% of the people who have died from COVID or COVID-related causes would have died within the year anyway. Would have died within the year anyway. Can, can, can we just pause there for just a moment? I mean, are, are we really in the place where we find comfort for ourselves in pointing out that the people who have died in the midst of this pandemic probably would have died within the year anyway? And that those who, who get critically ill or, or who, who face greater threat of death or people who have pre-existing conditions like high blood pressure and, and diabetes and, 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 and maybe they've got an, a compromised immune system or they've, 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 they've survived and gotten through cancer or something like that, and that, that somehow that puts them in a place where, where they might get sicker and, and that just kind of, you know, it is? It is what it is? No, is it, are we really in that place? Can, can you imagine Jesus responding that way? I, I don't see it happening. I mean, as Christians, we believe it, that every life is sacred. Every single life. Not just my life, not just your life. Every single life is sacred. And every single minute of life is a gift and a blessing. And so, you know, we, we grieve and we mourn when a life ends too soon. That is a big deal. And it certainly isn't something that... that that we should draw comfort from. You know, this, and this, this disease, it, 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 it hasn't just taken our lives. It's taken our livelihoods. You know, people have lost incomes. They've lost jobs. In, in both of these situations, let's look at the life of Jesus and what he says that we should do. Care for the least of these. Visit and comfort the sick. Take care of the poor and the hungry. Go to those who are in need and provide them the comfort and care that they need. Go to those who are grieving and weep with them and comfort them and sit with them. Over and over and over again in the story of Jesus Christ's life, we see him stepping into moments like this and getting people through it by loving them and caring for them and offering them grace and even making sacrifices for them. Look, I don't like wearing masks. I hate how much my glasses fog when I do it. I just want to see the world around me, but every breath I take, my glasses fog up. It drives me crazy. I'm so tired of social distancing. I want to give my friends a hug. I want to hug church members. I want to shake hands. I want to greet people. I want to spend time with people. I want to have events. I want to go and see people and spend time with people. I miss those things so, so very much. But I'm willing to do all of those things as long as it takes. I'll wear my mask. I will practice social distancing. I'll wave at you from a distance. I won't host big events. I won't do those things that I know could spread this disease because, God forbid, I can't imagine spreading this disease to someone that you love and someone that you care about. And because God cares for me, I'm, I'm going to care for you. And I'm going to do that. 
Because I think that's what Jesus would do. And and I'm going to leverage my resources so that those who have less than and who are really struggling can have enough to get by, even if it means that that I've got to have a little bit less. Because that's what Jesus would do, and that's what Jesus calls us to do. We we do that because God comforts us, and so now we're going to comfort others. God loves us, and so now we're going to love others. Let's talk about um, something else particularly that's happening in our city right now, though it it has much bigger ramifications. I'm recording this message on Thursday, which is the day after the grand jury um, announced its decision in the Breonna Taylor case. And and, and this situation is, um, it's tearing our community apart. And not just our community, but communities across the country. And and what's, what's happening in this moment is what so often happens in this moment. People are choosing sides. People are calling out the other side as, as evil and as wrong. People who are making mistakes, people who need to change. Um, you know, we, we've decided who's good and bad, who's right, who's wrong, who's righteous, who's evil, who's, who's filled with sin, who's filled with grace. And, and usually um, uh, we're the ones who are on the good guy's side and they're the ones who are on the bad gal's side and that's the way that that shapes up. It really just depends on which, which side you're on who's good and who's bad. You know, there, there are some people out there right now who believe that everything about our legal system is broken and flawed. There are people out there right now who believe that every single law enforcement officer abuses his or her power and that they're out there to cause more harm instead of good. At the same time, there are people out there who believe that all protesters and everyone who is protesting is bent on destruction and looting and violence. And there are people out there right now who believe that if you just do the right thing, you're never going to be treated wrongly by the law or law enforcement. Friends, neither one of those things is fair. And neither one of those statements about either one of those groups is fully accurate. Yes, there are things about our law and our legal system that are broken and fractured and they need reform. Yes, there are police officers who abuse their power, who have unjustly taken the lives of others and caused tremendous hurt and pain and they should be held accountable. But the vast majority of law enforcement officers are people who put on the uniform every single day They work hard. They sacrifice themselves. They love their community. And they're doing everything they can to protect and serve. And most people who are out there protesting, they're doing so peacefully. And and those who aren't, those who have taken it too far, who have, who have caused property damage and who are looting and taking things, and those who have, who have uh, resorted to violence. On Wednesday night, two police officers in Louisville were shot. And across our country, in response to some of this stuff, people have attacked and shot and killed law enforcement officers. And those things are not okay. And the people who do them should be held accountable. They're, they're not okay. But the people who are out there protesting and fighting for justice, fighting to make the changes that we really need to make happen, fighting to bring a greater sense of equity and and reconciliation and hope for all people in this nation, the majority of those people, they're doing it peacefully within the bounds of the law and within their rights in the Constitution. And yet, depending on which side we're on, We're elevating all the sins and brokenness of the other side and raising all the good things about our side. And and we're not claiming responsibility and and, and we've just got our sides. You know, as I look at this, I wonder, how is it that we're going to break through? How is it that we're going to get to the other side of this meantime moment where there is so much going on that's tearing our communities apart? How do we do it? Well, I... Again, I wonder, you know, maybe we look at the life of Jesus and we look at what he did. You know, Jesus, uh, he, he not only ate with um, those who were sinners and, and those who were broken and those who were marginalized and, and the tax collectors and, and all those folks. Jesus also ate and spent time with Pharisees 
and people who are in power. You know, Jesus spent time with the oppressed and Jesus spent time with the oppressor. Jesus spent time with the marginalized and Jesus spent time with those who were marginalizing them. Um, Jesus spent time with, with everybody that he could and he cared for them. Oh yeah, he called them out. He pushed for justice and he pushed for the right things and he wasn't afraid to call sin, sin and he wasn't afraid to call people out who were abusing their power. Jesus did those things. But Jesus also comforted everyone in all of their troubles. Now, when I've watched this, I just think, how? How did Jesus have the patience to do that? How did he have the grace to do that? Because, I don't know, maybe you're like me sometimes, I, I struggle to find that grace and that strength and that courage to reach out to people on the other side because I'm afraid and I'm scared and I get walled up. And, and instead of being brave and, and even vulnerable, I start to lash out. And then, and then I think about my Savior you know, J Jesus is an equal opportunity Savior. And, and he's, he's not just here for, for one side or the other. He, he's here for all of God's children. To offer us correction when we need it, to offer us encourages when, to encouragement when we need it. And as much as anything else, to offer us, offer us comfort and care. So that we can then comfort and care for others. You know, when, when we look at the passage that we looked at today, that we talked about today, the way that Jesus was able to do what he did is because our God is the creator, the parent of compassion. And Jesus embodied that compassion. And when he saw any of God's children, no matter what side they were on, when he saw them in trouble, it broke his heart. And he wanted to bring them home. What is it that we're doing with people who are on the other side? Are, are we seeing their trouble? Are we reaching out to them? Are we praying for them? Are, are we listening to their hurts and their pains and their fears, their worries and their concerns, their hopes and their aspirations? Are we really listening to them? And do we care? Do we care for them the way God cares for them? And do we care for them the way God calls us to care for them? Remember, God cares for us so that, so that we will care for others. Maybe, just maybe, if we can find a way to live that way, the way of the cross, the way of Jesus, accepting God's care and love, not just for ourselves, but so that we can care for others. We may find ourselves on the other side of this meantime moment far sooner than we'd ever imagined. Amen. and poor.
I've mentioned this before, but given the events of this week and, and my hope in coming around this table, I need to mention them again. When I was growing up, my stepfather was a police officer. And every day when he would leave to go out and serve and protect our community, I worried that he wouldn't come home. And as a young boy, I didn't care what it took for him to get home. I just wanted him to walk to the door at the end of the day. Now, I am the father of an African-American man. And every day when I think about him out in that world, I get worried. And I just want him to come home and walk through the door at the end of the day. I'm afraid that my son's name will be added to that ever-growing list of names, including Brianna Taylor. I'm afraid that the police officers that I know and love and care about, the law enforcement officers who are a part of our church, my friends, members of my faith family, I'm, I'm afraid they're going to be hurt, and I'm worried about them. It's this strange place of being caught in the middle, where at one moment I'm so afraid and angry that I just want to do anything I can to protect my son, and other moments where I'm so worried and concerned about those who I know are out there trying to do their best that I want to make sure that they're okay. And back and forth and back and forth. It's a hard place to be until I come to this table. Because when I get around this table and when I gather here for bread and cup at a place where we say all are welcome and we mean all means all, it means that everybody who's been impacted by what's happening in our world right now, what's happening in Louisville, it means they are welcome here. Anyone who is troubled and hurting and broken and wants to experience the grace of Christ, they are welcome here. Those who you see as being on the other side of the issue, those who you think are on the wrong side of the issue, they are loved and cared for by God, and God wants them to come here just as God wants you to come here because none of us are perfect and we all need God's grace. This is not to make an excuse for wrongdoing. We cannot ever get to the place God calls us to be if we just let go of wrongdoing. This is a place, though, where accountability meets grace, and everyone is welcome, where family members are afraid and worried that their loved ones who are law enforcement officers won't come home, and family members and members and people who have family members and who are themselves people of color who are worried and afraid each and every day that they won't come home. This is that place where all are gathered. And at this place, we model what the rest of the world should be. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it. 
He gave it to his disciples and he said to them, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he also took a cup and blessing it, he gave it to them saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. And so it is as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup that we proclaim and remember our Lord and Savior's life, death, and resurrection, his healing hope until he comes again. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, bless this bread and this cup and this table that it might be a place of restoration, reconciliation, healing, and hope for all of us who gather here. May it be a place where we receive grace so that we can offer grace, a place where we receive comfort so that we can offer comfort, a place where we are loved so that we can love one another. May this be a place that draws the people of God together, that loves us where we are but loves us too much to leave us there, instead calling us to a place of greater righteousness, greater justice, greater equity, and greater hope. May this meal strengthen us for that journey. May it comfort us all. And may it remind us that you are not just the God of some. You are the God of all. Amen. Friends, this table has been set, and everyone without exception is invited to partake. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. All of them. Receive now and be fed. This week's words of assurance. God will give us the motivation for change, the will to be reconciled. God will hear our heartfelt prayers when we speak of our deepest conflicts, when we give voice to the hidden grudges, when we name objects of our hate. God will hear us and God will make clear a way to understanding and to new beginnings. When we recognize that change will not be easy and that old hatreds die hard, but we will change. The way to peace will open up for us. God's pardon will be ours. Thanks be to God. God gives us these good gifts. We often just need to accept them. Have you had a chance to experience these gifts from God? Or are you looking for ways to experience these gifts? I want to invite you to journey here with us at First Christian Church. If you want to recommit your faith, if you've been joining us online or even outside, and now you feel like it's the right time to join our community of faith, maybe you want to profess your faith and make plans for a baptism, let us know. Call us, text us, email us. We can spend time with you in prayer. 
and hear your journey. We are still church, we are still community, and we want to connect with you. Our staff, along with our elders and our Stephen ministers, are here to listen and pray with you. Reach out and let us know how God is working in your life. As we go from this time together, we each have choices before us. Let us choose the life that is joyful and fulfilling. Let us choose the life that goes beyond the well-known borders. Let us choose a life that seeks a way of reconciliation. Let us choose the life that shares with generosity. Let us choose the life that is lived as a disciple of Jesus. Amen.